Okay. Let's make a start, shall we? Um, welcome everyone uh, to this evening's event on the progressive majority. We've had to upgrade our Zoom account a few times in the last 48 hours to get you all in. Um, it's the sort of digital, digital equivalent of standing room only. Um, I think it shows that there's unprecedented enthusiasm for cross-party alliances, not four weeks before a general election, but four years before a general election. And to be honest, um, it can't start soon enough, the kind of cooperation we're going to need if we want a different kind of government and a different kind of politics and a different kind of society. Um, not sure exactly what the running order is going to be. Um, uh, Grace is going to say a few words in a minute about the report that we published of uh, this week on uh, why we need a progressive majority and why it's now possible. I'll say a few words and then hopefully Layla will come in before she's got to go to the chamber. Um, we've got John Crudders, we've got Tommy Shepherd, we've got Caroline Lucas, and we've even got Clive Lewis um, uh, to make some contributions about why we need this different politics for a different kind of society. Um, please use the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom, uh, to post any thoughts, comments, ideas, links, whatever you want. Obviously, be polite and be wonderful. This is a compass crowd, so we expect nothing less. Um, use the Q&A function to uh, put any questions you've got for the panel or to uh, me and to Compass. And you can go into the uh, Q&A thing and vote for your favourite question so that those questions get asked. There's a lot of people on the call, almost 500 at the moment. Um, so we're not going to get that many in, and we've got some great speakers, we want to mostly hear from them, but we'll take as many questions as we can. Um, if you want to tweet about the, the call tonight, then use the hashtag Progressive Majority, please. So um, we'll hear from our politicians in just a minute. Grace, um, you're up first. You really uh, did a lot of the work on the report that we've uh, published this week, which has got you know, quite a lot of uh, news and coverage. Um, do you want to just run us through some of the highlights, which just sets out how difficult it is, in essence, for Labour to win alone and therefore why we need a politics of alliances? Yeah, sure. I'm just going to share my screen so I can show some nice graphs as well. Um, so the report, we start out by looking at the idea of Labour winning the next general election on its own and how that could be possible. And the answer is, it's almost impossible for that to happen. Um, so here we go. A national swing of 10.52% will be required, which is larger than the swing in 1997 and in 1945, which were both Labour landslides. Um, in terms of seats, that means winning an additional 124 seats and not losing any, just to get a majority of one. Um, which, so we, we dig into a bit of the maths of that in the report and the short version is that's really highly unlikely to happen. Um, that's before we even consider that a Labour comeback in Scotland is looking almost impossible. Um, and if we don't count Scotland, that required national swing jumps up to 13.8%, which is very big. Um, and also, um, we don't, this is before we consider the fact that we've got upcoming boundary reviews sometime in the next few years, which would hugely benefit the Conservatives and hurt almost every other party. Um, so actually on the next slide, this is this table is in the report, if you want to look at it in more detail, but you can see that if we run the result of the 2019 election with the projected boundary reviews, which are just projections, but they give us a pretty good idea of where things are headed, the Conservatives would have won 15 more seats than they actually did, and Labour would have won nine fewer you can see the Lib Dems also suffer and the Greens lose the one seat that they oh, do have um no yeah which is obviously a pretty catastrophic result um so and so this graph on the left also shows uh Labour's position in Scotland so you can see that they're really struggling for air between the SNP the Tories I'm sure we're going to address this later in the call so I won't spend too much time on that um but there is another way that we discover. So a national swing of 3.18% away from the Tories would see them lose their majority. And we have a look at uh, some data from 2017 and 2019, which shows two key battlegrounds. Um, I'll show you a graph. So you can see here, we've got one, the, Le the Labour and Tory battleground, and then Lib Dem Tory. But you can see there's really no fight here between Labour and the Lib Dems. There's a handful of seats in the country where 
Labour and Lib Dem are actually in direct competition with each other. Um, so that was eye opening. Um, so we see the Lib Dems are second in 80 Conservative held seats where Labour are a long way behind. And we look at what we call some progressive tragedies from 2019, where when we added up the combined progressive vote, we found that it outweighed the combined progressive vote. Um, obviously, we're not saying that if the vote hadn't been split, it would definitely have been a progressive win, but we're just pointing out that it's these, these tragedies are happening and we really need to think about why that's happening when, as so we'll go on to this a bit later, I think the other speakers will address this, but we found we looked at the manifestos from 2019 and found that a lot of the progressive parties were highly aligned on a lot of issues. So um, I'll hand back to Neil now, but that should give you a good idea of the kind of stuff the report covers and um, what the kind of stuff we'll be digging into tonight. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Grace, and thanks for all your work on, on the report. It's really, really worth reading. I mean, it makes a pretty unanswerable case about why you need electoral uh, cooperation. Um, uh, so so do, read, do read the report. Um, so look, um, the Guardian leader column said today, quoting back something that Grace and I said in the report, that Labour ought to drop its tribalism rather than its policies. Look, it is absolutely clear that we win together or we lose apart. And in that sense of kind of electoral, electoral politics and electoral alliances, it doesn't mean that we have some soggy compromise. Rather, it is a politics which is green, liberal and socialist, the best of all worlds. Not one big tent of failure, but a campsite that makes us all stronger. A places where we can keep our political identity, but share something bigger. The hope that we can transform our society. And we're a year into this, and we don't expect Keir Starmer or Ed Davey to be part of these meetings yet. They have to get their own houses in order, and we have to give them the time and space to do that. But the electoral logic, if we begin, as we begin to, to set out, is absolutely inescapable. We have to prepare the ground now so that, so that what's, what's necessary is what becomes inevitable. Not a last minute fix, not a coalition of, of losers, but an alliance for change to transform our country. A broad values and common platform to make us much more equal, sustainable and democratic. And at the heart of that common platform, uh, a, a policy of just two initials, PR. There is now a beautiful logic in all of this, that if we can get Labour over the line on PR to join the Liberal Democrats, to join the SNP, to join the Greens and to join Pride Comrade, um, even to join the bloody Brexit party on PR, then you've got the basis of the parties coming together and all of them knowing there's something in it for, for them. And then you build the coalition that can then win office and then can implement and, and legislate for PR. And then at a stroke, we change the politics and the future of our country for good. The kind of uh, you know, far right, hard right Brexit that we've seen, the kind of hard right conservative party that we've got at the moment just isn't possible in a world of PR. To get us there, Labour has to change and it is changing. 75% of its members back the shift to PR. We've got this new initiative, Labour for New Democracy, campaigning hard to win the party over. Over 100 CLPs have now backed PR. We need more of it. We need pressure within the party and we need pressure outside of the party to shift to PR. We have three or four years to plan this, to do this. We don't need to decide on the form of electoral collaboration now. It could be stand aside, it can be tactical campaigning. You know, it could be primaries, it could be all sorts of things. What matters now is building the values, the trusts and the relationships about building the links between leaders, between MPs, between the think tanks and on the ground in constituencies where it matters. We can't say we haven't been, we haven't been warned. That's what this report was all about. The system is rigged against us and we have to change the rules if we're going to win. We can look for, for differences if we want and we can remember grudges. I'll raise you the coalition and you'll see me the Iraq war. And Boris Johnson is the only person, the only person smiling. We need each other, not just for votes, but for hope. We need each other's values, we need each other's history, and we need each other's energy. A government, not just with Clive Lewis, but with Layla and Caroline, is a way, way better government. Now, some of this is tricky, 
and we're going to be hearing from Tommy um, on the call, Tommy Shepherd from the SNP, and I'm so glad he's here, because we're going to have to talk with our Scottish comrades. Look, if, you know, the vast majority of people in Scotland who want independence want it for the right reasons, because they want a better Scotland. They want a Scotland which is more equal, democratic and sustainable. We're going to have to work our way through that and think about that and talk to those people whose values we share. Um, it's not all going to be easy, but we're only going to do it by talking. So we've got three or four years to dig deep so we can build higher. And I'd ask everyone on this call to join Compass so we can build this progressive alliance with you, getting you involved in our new party groups, in our local alliances, helping to build that common platform of ideas. We can't do it without you. So a year ago, it feels a lot longer, doesn't it, after the year that we've all just had. Progressive votes were divided and we got smashed. They will go on winning. The right will go on winning until we change the game. We have to say now, never again. We won't allow it. I'm fed up losing. I'm fed up seeing lives go to waste. I'm fed up seeing our planet destroyed. It's too precious to be lost in the squabbles of the mist of time. The future will not be regressive. It will be progressive, but only because we make it plural, because we do it together. What unites us is so much more hopeful and transformative than that which divides us. So let us unite. Today, let's vow to build a majority for change. Let's vow to start doing that now. And I can, I can hear you in my mind's eye now, applauding in your living rooms and your homes after that little contribution. Um, thanks so, so much. Um, who have we got on so far now? Has, has Layla managed to join us yet? She's here. Layla, I don't know if you heard any of that. You've probably gone to I sleep. Did. If you, I you, did you, all you, of probably, it. You've probably gone to sleep or something. Not I know at you, all. I, know I, you, I, I was cheering you on, Neil. Everyone. I, know you've, I know you've got to get off into the chamber to, 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 to make a contribution there. But before you do that, why don't you kick us off and make a contribution here and tell us why we need this kind of cross-party working and what's the Liberal Democrat view on that? Thank you so much for being well, here. Layla thank Moran. you so much. Thank you so much all. Wow, what a crowd. I mean, oh, I wish we were there in person. Yeah. We've got 560 people. Can you imagine that in a big hall all together and the energy that that was? So let's just pretend and put our mind's eye because that's where we are. And I think it's really credit to what you have built um, as Compass, but actually I think a real appetite out there right now for, as you say, uh, stop losing. That's the main thing. We cannot allow this government to continue. The reason why I'm wanting to hop foot to the chamber is so that I can tell them to their faces what they are doing to this country, whether it be over their mishandling of coronavirus, this ridiculousness over entertaining a no-deal Brexit, or indeed the awful deal that they're likely to bring back. And we have to remember why we are doing this. We are doing this because collectively, we want a better country, and we know that that country cannot exist with the current Conservative government in charge. That is why we are doing this, and we have to make that happen. Every year that goes by, that they are not caring as much as we do about poverty and inequality and the climate is another year wasted in the middle of what is going to be enormous emergencies in all of those areas. And so we have a lot in common. And I think this is why the, the proportional representation vote is so important because what it celebrates is that we aren't the same. There is no suggestion here that we are going to merge. I know some people have suggested it in the past. I don't actually want to do that. If I wanted to join Labour, I'd have joined Labour. If I wanted to join the Greens, I'd have joined the Greens. I'm not in Scotland, so I wouldn't have joined the SFP. But you did get the point. Like We would have joined the other parties. And in fact, there were some who did in the last parliament. Well, it's an option. And it's one that I don't want. Because there are things about the Liberal Democrats that I love that are unique. And I want to continue to make that case. But it is also true that at the moment our current electoral system punishes us in our beautiful diversity of political discourse in this country. And what it seems to show the rest of the world, but also the people of this country, is that we don't give them the governments that they ask for. And that is why it is so important that we actually recognize the system that we're in, the catastrophic first past the post system and work to overcome it. And it can work, I know it can, because it did in Oxford, Western Abingdon 
in 2017. Uh, 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 there were a number of recent elections that the Lib Dems uh, aren't particularly happy with, and that well, actually wasn't uh, the best either. We returned 12, but I was a bit of a shock. And the reason why Oxford Western Abingdon was a bit of a shock, and I it was a shock to me, apart from anything else, was because there was a grassroots campaign organized by a progressive alliance of voters, very much Compass was part of it, and so were others. And what it meant was that we had members of all parties coming out and campaigning with me, beside me, not behind me, we definitely saw it in those terms, in order to, de to defeat the Conservative then minister. And the point I want to make is this, we couldn't have done it if we didn't attract Conservative voters. So I want to make a plea. If we are going to attack anyone, it is Boris Johnson and the government. But don't make the mistake of demonizing everyone who voted Conservative at the last election because in those 80 seats where the Liberal Democrats are second, they are the ones alongside Labour and Green votes that we need to get us over the line. So let's just be really careful about talking about those voters. We talk to them as friends, friends who want the same country as we do, thought the Tories were the ones to deliver it, and we need to show them that it's the Tories that have let them down. It's the Conservative Party and it's Boris Johnson that we need to go after and we need to make that clear distinction. And my second thing I wanted to encourage people to do is to start building those grassroots alliances now and thank you for the work that Compass is doing to start to make that ecosystem exist. It's so important. But we've also got really important May elections coming up and a number of conservative councils that we can take off them just as we did in South Oxfordshire District Council, which is now run we created an alliance and it's now run in coalition with the Lib Dems and the Greens. We can do it. We can already start seizing power away from the Conservatives. And the reason we need to start doing it now and the reason we need to have those conversations is because, and I'm going to address what you mentioned earlier, Neil, the elephant in the room, there is a lack of trust at the grassroots level between the parties. There are those who are happy to, you know, shout about, as you said, whether it be coalition or something else, and then they'll say that, but it could well be something to do at a council level. And it's just not helpful. By all means, have a robust political conversation with each other, but sometimes it gets personal. Sometimes it gets downright ugly. And that is what needs to stop right up and down the country. So we can lead by example. And in those areas where we can work together to take seats off the Tories, we must. And by talking, you build trust, and where there is trust, there is hope. And where there's hope, we can win. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, everyone. And I'm sorry Brilliant. I can't be here for the whole time. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Leila. You know, we'll get you back to answer some questions uh, another time. And I think the point that you make about conservative voters, you know, they're not our enemy. And I mean, they can't be. And um, we need, you know, particularly we need your party to persuade conservative voters to vote for a kind of progressive option. Um, and, and it's up, up to the Labour Party in part to give you the room to do that. Or the Labour Party can go back to a kind of, you know, a Blairite big tent if it wants to. But that isn't going to work again. I mean, because that was a particular moment in time and it's not repeatable. So I think we've got to be kind of generous to those people and create the space because there's no way around winning over soft Conservative voters. So good luck with your work um, doing that, Leila, and good luck in the Chamber uh, uh, as well. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks so much for being here. And we're going to turn to John Crudders now, who's been with Compass virtually all the way through, has been all the way through, um, and has been one of the more thoughtful, uh, most thoughtful members of uh, the, the, the House of Commons. Um, John, you've always supported a plural politics, a politics of, of PR, you know, of alliances. You know, tell us why and what do you think about the moment? Thanks, John, for being here. All right. Cheers, Neil. Um, I just want to make um, a couple of points, really, and say how much I very much welcome this event. Um, the first is a sort of obvious point that you cannot detach our conversation today from the wider endangered status of liberal democracy. Um, it's on display places like Russia, Turkey, Brazil, Poland, Hungary, but also in places with more resilient historic traditions such as Italy and the USA. And here in the UK, it's certainly being severely tested. I was looking yesterday at some research from Cambridge University, Cambridge Centre for Democracy, which recently concluded that dissatisfaction with liberal democracy, 
democracy itself amongst the developed countries to be at the highest levels for almost 25 years. In the UK in 2019, pre-pandemic, the dissatisfaction levels were the highest ever recorded. And it begs the obvious question of how we rebuild our democracies, the subject of our conversation today. Also, there was a Hansard Society report that suggested long-term shifts in public attitudes, growing UK disenfranchisement, disenchantment, declining confidence in parliamentary traditions and a willingness to embrace authoritarian ideas, which I quote, challenge core tenets of our democracy. Um, it was just brought home to me this lunchtime, actually, I do a regular East London Essex radio call in and the levels of, um, let's call it COVID denial, anti-lockdown anger, anti-vaccine conspiracy theories were off the charts, all sort of wrapped up in a language of anti-elite, anti-foreigner, anti-expert populism. And I'm, um, should we say, fairly used to far right politics, but the way it is now refracted through the management of the pandemic was pretty worrying and it will get worse. Um, simply put, this suggests a sort of moral imperative to reset our democratic architecture. And the second point is that the first past the post system and the centralized UK constitution is ill-equipped for the scale of the challenge that lies ahead. Not least as this hard Brexit ethno-nationalism has always been mentioned in England is being driven by elites who scavenged the discontents of the dispossessed and gain the electoral system. And this will continue. Um, it seems to me once we regain some control of the pandemic, the Tory strategy is pretty clear cut. Reshape the public square, question the role of the BBC, Channel 4, culture wars around the universities, especially the humanities, the social sciences, challenge the role of the Supreme Courts, the judges, further voter suppression, boundary reform, alongside a sort of economic nationalism. And the response has to be one that deepens democracy. De democracy is the organizing principle against such a strategy. Third point I'd make very briefly is the Compass Report, We Divide, They Conquer, is absolutely brilliant, concise to the point, unarguable. And um, I just want to repeat a couple of stats that I picked up while Grace was talking that need to be repeated. After four defeats in the last decade, Labour needs to win 124 seats for a one-seat majority. 10.52% swing, bigger than 97 and 45. And if we discount Scotland, and Tom will remind me, but I think we stand at about 15% in the polls at the moment, that we were talking about a 13.8% swing. That's before any boundary changes, which are likely to help the Tories and hurt Labour. So to even begin to achieve such swings, we, sh we would need to unite the country and overcome the binaries that are polarising our politics between the young and the old, leave remain between the classes, lost red wall communities, urban heartlands, between those with and without a degree. All of this to be achieved by a Labour Party currently pretty disfigured by internal factional tensions. To say that is an epic challenge is almost an understatement. So the fourth point is slightly more positive than what I've just said. A swing of just 3.18% away from the Tories means that they lose their majority. So the difference between 13.8% and 3.18% encapsulates for me the whole debate around the need for a a renewed pluralism, coalition, progressive alliance. We've just gone through a decade, a, uh, a low dishonest decade, to quote Auden, whereby the country has been driven by the overriding interests of keeping the Tories together as a party. And I'm personally getting a bit fed up with it. So the overriding imperative, as I get older, is to get rid of this type of Tory politics, which has bent through austerity, Brexit, and incubated a right-wing English nationalism to protect the Tory party and squeeze out even more populist right-wing forces. Um, this has to be stopped. Self-evidently, Labour cannot do it on its own. So the fifth point I'd make simply relates to Labour. Historically in Labour, there's always been this tension between those who support constitutional and political reform in principle and those who from time to time embrace it for instrumental reasons. And the problem is that it gains popularity the further we are away from power and the closer we get to power, support for it tends to drain away. In the 80s, at the high point of Thatcherism, when there appeared no way back for Labour, support for change increased. By about 1990, if I remember it, it was about 50-50 at Labour conference for and against PR. Yet the closer we got to power in the 90s, the less it became a priority. So for the sort of traditional utilitarian right and left, it's all about state capture at Westminster and pulling levers. 
constitution and electoral reform tend to be seen as the preserve of the soft liberal left, second order issues at best, a sideshow at worst. So the solution must be to demonstrate how is constitutional and political, the constitution and political architecture that undermines the capacity for enduring economic and social change. So democratic change is the gateway for economic and social change. The sixth point I make is despite what I've just said, there is change is possible in and around Labour. In the midst of the 2017 election campaign, we nearly secured a breakthrough, and this is forgotten. Um, when the suggestion of standing down in a constituency, I think it was the Isle of Wight, was seriously considered by our NEC and leadership. It was only a runner, however, because many feared an imminent electoral wipeout, so it was hardly bored of a pluralist conviction, but change was possible then. Um, in the leadership election of Keir Starmer, he implied both support for a constitutional convention and was open-minded for a debate around PR. So the idea is in play. And Keir Starmer stated that he sees his leadership in three phases. Firstly, establishing trust. Secondly, creating a vision. And finally, landing policy. So you need to use next year to make a renewed case for constitutional and electoral change. Um, I was talking to Laura Parker last week. and She said evidence suggests that possibly up to 100 Labour MPs are supportive of PR. I was surprised, but that's a fantastic base camp to go forward next year. Finally, I'd make the point that the idea of a progressive alliance has never been more vital ethically to challenge the emergence of authoritarian populism, instrumentally to create a coalition to remove the majority from this government. And it taps into a desire for change. The outstanding question for me is quite simple. Has Labour the capacity, the agility, the desire to situate itself as, as part of a coalition necessary to for such a process to be embedded. I don't know. The jury's out. It's a question really of political will and imagination amongst Labour. I am personally hopeful without being over optimistic. There are lots of possibilities, um, but no guarantees. So I'll leave it at that, Neil. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, John. And thanks for that bigger sweep of the, the nature of, of the challenge, because this is deep. And I think, you know, there's other people thinking about that, you know, with us that, you know, that this is about the future of democracy now. And the right know that e either we win and we get that democratic pluralist future or they get to control stuff even tighter. I mean, the stakes have never been so high in our political life. I mean, this isn't just about the normal to and fro swings and roundabouts of electoral British politics. This is about the future of our collective decision making ability. Um, uh, and that's why, you know, we've got to get um, this right. Um, and look, and one of the issues, you know, you know, quite understandably, is Scotland. And as I said earlier, and if I was a young progressive, and I wanted a, you know, a more democratic, sustainable, you know, equal future, you know, I'd probably be in the sort of camp that Tommy was in, in you know, in Scotland, I'd be pissed off that the Tories keep winning. Um, that the, the mail and the Murdoch and the city seem to run everything, you know, and I think we have to start understanding that, you know, people who want independence in Scotland don't want it because they just want to be separate. They want it because they want to build a bit of better society. And we've got to have a dialogue with those people about how we manage that relationship, whatever in the end of the day, the Scottish people decide to do, you know, whether some of us hope they stay or whether they get what, you know, what, what Tommy wants, you know, they're going to be on our border, they're going to be with us, we're going to have to work out how to live with them. We're going to have to work out how to live with them the other side of an election because there isn't going to be any independence before the next election and there's probably going to be a big block of Tommy and his colleagues that are going to be part of that Westminster voting system and we're going to need their help to try and keep the Conservatives out and to do the stuff that John's been talking about. So, Tommy, over to you, mate. Thanks so much for being here and talk us through some of that. Thank you. Thanks, Neil, and uh, greetings from Edinburgh. And thanks to Grace for the report. I, I, I read it and I thought um, it was quite compelling, particularly as regards to the situation in England. Uh, clearly, everyone will appreciate the situation in Scotland is, is somewhat different. So what I wanted to try and do was to explore the relationship between the Campaign for Scottish Independence uh, and the wider progressive change uh, movement across Britain. Now, I think it's worth saying at the beginning that, that not everyone agrees that there is or ought to be a relationship. There are some people in my own party who would question the wisdom of me spending time doing this, saying I ought to be concentrating on uh, delivering what people in Scotland want and what happens in England and, and Wales is a matter for the people who live in those countries. And there are also plenty on the English left who uh, still are um, 
are not even ambivalent about the movement for Scottish independence. I, I think they they view it as uh, as not an aggressive uh, move, and they, they they fear that it is mitigating against the capacity to build a united reform movement uh, across Britain. Uh, I think they're wrong. I think, uh, in essence, the character of the movement for uh, self-government in Scotland is very progressive. And I think it is important that everyone in the UK understands the, the contemporary nature of Scottish nationalism, because it's an awful lot different from its caricature. I'll just touch on three aspects in, in particular. The first is um, identity. It's important to say that whilst the independence movement is, is popular, it is not populist. It is not based around any cultural or ethnic paradigm which others, people who don't conform to it. Quite the contrary, it is inclusive and it is diverse. Uh, secondly, it is not about separating Scotland from anybody else or uh, building, uh, building barriers or putting up, putting up uh, barriers and walls between people, uh, as it is often caricature. It is about achieving the political capacity to be able not just to run our own affairs in Scotland, but to determine the relationships that we will have with other people across Britain, across Europe, and across the globe. And in that sense, the contemporary move movement for independence is all about connecting Scotland with the world and engaging a Scottish voice in the world and trying to be part of a global community. And the third thing to say about contemporary Scottish nationalism is pretty much everyone in the camp, they see it as a means to an end. And the end in question is universally the desire to socially and economically reform the country that we're living in and create a better one based on fairness and justice and based on equality. And there have been, throughout, actually throughout the history of the Union for the last 300 years, there has been an overlap between those who wish constitutional change and want Scotland to be a self-governing country and those on the left who seek social and economic change. Quite often they have been far apart, these camps, but occasionally they have come together. And they have come together no more so than in the present time, which is why I believe that actually within the movement for Scottish independence, you will find the main movement for social and democratic change. And that is why the SNP has eclipsed and has overtaken and is now playing the role that the Labour Party used to play in terms of being a mass representative party of the, of the centre left. And it is popular. Uh, the, we now have, today, in fact, we have the, the 17th opinion poll in a row to record a majority support for Scotland becoming an independent country. Uh, and we have also got in unprecedented levels of support for the SNP as a political party, which brings me to the elections in May next year, which are just less than five months away. Uh, in that Scottish general election, it will be, I, I would call it the right to choose election. People won't be asked to vote to become an independent country, but they will be voting to assert that they have the right to make that choice. And the only opposition to this that the Tories can seem to muster is the fact that you, you had a vote in 2014 and you're not getting one again because the matter is dealt with. And they point out that people said at the time that this was a once in a generation decision and that my generation isn't yet dead, so we're not getting another one. Actually, it is true that leaders of the Yes movement did use the phrase once in a generation, but they did that as a warning to those who supported independence that they might not get the chance again, not as a condition uh, or, 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 or a qualification to those who opposed independence that we would never get the vote again. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't really matter who said what 10 years ago, what matters is what the people want to do. And if the people of Scotland vote and mandate a Scottish government to have a referendum, then I believe that every Democrat across Britain, whether or not they agree with the principle of having a referendum, they should agree with the principle that the people, if they vote for one, should be allowed to have one. But even if things um, go the way I'd like them to do, and, and we win the elections in May, and we then, within probably 12 to 18 months, are able to organise with consent of the British government, uh, a further referendum, and if that referendum votes for Scotland to become a self-governing country, uh, even if that all goes according to the way I'd like to see it, it is a racing certainty that Scotland will still be part of the United Kingdom by the time the next Westminster 
an election comes around. And therefore, I think the SNP will be contesting the what will end if the Boundary Commission goes through the 58 seats uh, in Scotland uh, at that election in 23 or, or, or by the summer of 24 at the latest. Uh, therefore, if our performance uh, at that election is anything like it has been in the last three Westminster general elections, uh, we will form a vital component and a potential building block of an, a non-Tory majority in the House of Commons. And I, I, mean, I, I, I think I speak for all of my colleagues when we say we would enthusiastically enjoy that role and wish to be part of that solution. We will not allow over, on any circumstances, the Conservatives to form a government if we are in a position to vote against them and prevent them from doing so. And Nicola Sturgeon did declare, in fact, a year ago that she would actively seek to support a minority Labour government under Jeremy Corbyn if that was what the electorate uh, dealt people in the, in the general election, which never came to pass. But if a hung parliament does come to pass again, then the SNP would very much want to engage with other parties to be part of forming a, a non-Tory bloc. Uh, there are three reasons to my mind why we should do why I'll argue with, with my, my own supporters, some of whom might be uh, you know, lukewarm in the prospect, but there are three reasons I tell them it's vital that we do this. Uh, the first is that for the time being and until the end of any transition period, we would be part of the United Kingdom and the policies there matter. They matter to us, and we also, we also matter to people in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And therefore, we want to oust the Tories, get rid of their policy programme, and begin to bring in a, more, a, a set of more progressive policies. Uh, secondly, we would hope by that time to be in discussions around a transition period about exactly how Scotland will become self-governing and what the terms of it will be, and what the terms of our relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom and therefore, it's in our interest to have a government who would engage in that process positively. But thirdly, and I think most importantly, that whether or not Scotland becomes an independent, co independent country, it doesn't uh, you know, rule out the need for progressive uh, people north and south of the Scottish border to work together on the island of Britain. And in fact, a post-independence new Scottish state would want to engage very constructively on climate, on equality, and a whole range of other matters uh, with, 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 with people in England and in Wales. And therefore, that good relationship that I hope would, that would be there between England and Scotland and the English and Scottish left in particular after independence, the genesis of that is now. And I'll finish now by just saying that, I mean, if I, I spent a long time in London, if I, was, if I was still there, I think I would be relishing the prospect of what may be happening in Scotland, because I don't think you can understate the extent to which uh, the process of Scotland voting for and seeking to become an independent country causes major political upsets and uh, provides the catalyst for major political change elsewhere. If at some stage, if things go the way I want them to go, Westminster and the British Parliament will have to consider an act of Parliament which effectively will re rearrange things after the union has been dissolved. Because we're talking about reforming the United Kingdom out of existence. And when we come to consider what would follow on from it, that is also the context in which we begin to ask questions about, well, is there, this is the right time to abolish the House of Lords? Is this the right time to get serious about the prospect of English regional government? And is this the right time to get rid of first past the post and have a fair voting system? And if we can be part of that process in the mid-20s, uh, as, as we are becoming an independent country, if we can also be part of that political reform within the United Kingdom, we would be delighted to have the opportunity to do that. It would be very much our swan song and our, uh, our, our present to the left elsewhere in Britain and, uh, and an indication of our bona fides and our good wishes to work constructively in the future. Fantastic, Tommy. A man with a white beard bearing presence for, for all at, uh, at, this, at this seasonal uh, moment. Uh, fantastic. And look, this is the great thing about Compass and, and our pluralism that, you know, that we welcome this conversation. 
Um, we want to hear what people in the SNP have to say. We want to have a dialogue with them. We want to, you know, want this conversation because it's the only way we're going to develop. So absolutely brilliant to, to have you here. And, and just finally on the SNP, the fact that you support proportional representation, despite the fact that it's not quite in your electoral interests, um, is, a, is an issue of principle that I think a lot of a lot of us south of the border who want PR um, uh, uh, welcome and, and cherish. And I was just laughing on the on the chat on a, the chat thing with Clive that you know we just put this panel in place so that you lot can chat on the in the chat box. There's just hundreds and hundreds of comments about what people think. So we're really glad that we've we've uh, provided a platform for you to uh, to talk to each other. And um, we're going over to um, Caroline Lucas next, um, who's come back from uh, listening in to somebody in, in the chamber. And Caroline Lucas is the person who she knows who started all this really, because Compass was just trundling along in the sort of um, early 2000s as a labor only uh, pressure group until we started working with Caroline Lucas and, work, and worked out that she probably believes in the things that we believed in, you know, more than we did. And it was ridiculous not to allow her to be a member of Compass. I've actually got a check to find out whether she's become a member of Compass. Um, but we changed our rules and opened ourselves up to Tommy, to Caroline, to Layla, people of no party and all party who followed and believed in our good society value and visions. So it's all Caroline's fault. Over to you, Caroline. Thanks so much, Neil. And uh, no, seriously, thank you for opening Compass up. It was a brave move, but I think it was the right one. And I think, yeah, discussions like this kind of demonstrate that. It is always a pleasure to be part of a Compass event, so thank you for continuing to believe in a better future and to work for a better politics. And it strikes me that these things aren't just possible, they are critical to our very survival and that we don't have the luxury of time on our side. You know, 2010 is on course to be the hottest year on record. Record fires have raged in the Amazon and the US, ice caps in Greenland melt at a terrifying pace Storm Etta has wreaked havoc and unimaginable tragedy in Central America. At the same time, the UN reports that a million, a million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinct, extinction. So essentially every warning light on the dashboard is flashing red. And those interlinked climate and nature emergencies, I think are the biggest mountain we face right now. With fewer than 10 years to turn things around, we can't afford to be held back by an outdated and broken political culture. Unless we do something very different, the Conservatives will likely win the next two elections. That is another decade potentially of moral bankruptcy, another decade of relentless economic growth on a planet of finite resources, another decade of unconscionable damage to communities, to our public services, to the welfare state, to people's life chances. And I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that the next 10 years are probably the most important in the history of humankind. I know that does sound a little bit, a little bit big, but when you are serious about the climate, climate and nature emergencies, then they do demand that we do things differently and that we don't have forever to get this right. It is urgent. I think they demand nothing less than a rapid and radical transformation of how political parties cooperate. And that transformation, I think, has to be rooted in our shared values. Recent years have seen our common progressive histories somewhat tested by divisions, whether it's the Lib Dems going into coalition or Scottish independence. I think too often we've been distracted from the values that unite us. We're different parties because we have different policies, but unless we can focus on what we have in common, we'll never realize the full potential of our shared strength. There is strength in acknowledging that no one party has a monopoly on wisdom, that no one party has the inalienable right to hold on to its power. And we know that there's strength to be found in political diversity and plurality too. But even all of that isn't ambitious enough. Our understanding of a thriving political culture needs reimagining and expanding to encompass a politics that is generous by design a politics that has doing more good as, as its explicit and primary purpose, and a politics that is grounded in trust, openness, and the redistribution of power. Now, practicing cooperation helps to lay solid foundations for the future. And I want to just look back at, at, at where we are right now, because you know, under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party, you know, while Labour's policy on Brexit may have been facing in several different directions, to put it politely, nonetheless, Jeremy Corbyn did regularly bring all the opposition parties together 
to discuss and to explore cooperation on parliamentary strategy on Brexit. When Greta Thunberg responded to my invite to come to Parliament in 2018, the leaders of all the oppositions put their differences aside. They sat around the same table and pledged to an ongoing dialogue, recognizing that the climate emergency transcends every political line in the sand. In my home city of Brighton and Hove, a shared commitment to social and environmental change has powered increased cooperation between Labour and the Greens, first in a, a Labour-led administration, now in one led by the Green Party. Other combinations of parties are doing the same elsewhere too, both formally and informally. But unfortunately, so far at least, meaningful cross-party cooperation is not yet part of Keir Starmer's lexicon of leadership, even in relation to COVID. You know, I've been urging him to work cross-party on this, as have others, because it's the right thing to do in a global pandemic. But more than that, if we don't forge new ways of working now, we'll vastly diminish our chances of tackling inequality and climate injustice in the future. Winning that future can't be done by any political leader going it alone. Essentially, the stakes are too high. Winning the future needs a new kind of political leadership for a new political culture one that unites rather than divides and that puts the common good above party loyalty. Now, I know that practicing political cooperation is critical, but that it isn't easy. It's not easy for any of us. For the Greens, our ability to keep the climate and nature crisis on the agenda has traditionally come in part from our serving as an electoral threat to other parties. And there is a tension between that reality and the kind of progressive alliances seen to date. You know, progressive, progressives happily deride our voting system, and yet its outcomes determine the standard approaches to electoral cooperation. In other words, when the conversation turns to unifying the progressive vote, smaller parties like the Greens, who are massively disadvantaged under the current system, are too often expected simply to stand down. We're told to get out of the way for the bigger opposition parties that perform better under our twisted system. Well, I don't think that's fair. And frankly, it's a prime example of madness being repeating the same behavior over and over whilst expecting different results. We're trying to win something big here, a better version of the future we're currently headed for. And how we get there is just as important as the destination. So if we want a fairer future, then fairness has to be built in to this new political culture that we're creating. So the next big mountain to climb then is to dream much bigger. Candidates bullied for daring to contest some elections doesn't feel exciting to me. Seat by seat horse trading shouldn't be the limit of our ambition. Shaping a new political culture requires a different strategy and a bolder set of goals. You know, primaries perhaps would be a good place to start. And so are other forms of local democracy. Why not citizens assemblies about how to do politics better and ensure it engages with everyone, for example. Why not a renewed conversation about shared candidacies, candidacies the chance to vote for Labour Green candidates or Lib Dem Women Equality Party candidates. And we need to canvass communities now about how they'd vote if their vote really counted. In a fast changing political context where data is power, that is the kind of information we need, not the results of polls that become outdated almost, soon, almost as soon as they happen. Proportional representation is clearly key to restoring and renewing our democracy. And with Scotland poised to vote for independence in any future referendum, the prospects for the left in England and Wales are dire unless we do change our voting system. So I welcome the fact that Keir Starmer has opened the door to PR, but we're going to go into the next election with first past the post. So I think we shouldn't be afraid to hold Labour's feet to the fire over its commitment to a plural future. Let's not be afraid to, to seek those cast iron guarantees that the next progressive led government will de deliver a fair voting system. Let us not sacrifice this chance to utterly transform our political culture. So uh, a new kind of politics isn't just a, a nice to have or a way to get Labour into power. I really believe that it is the only hope of avoiding climate and nature disaster. So as we begin to climb the many mountains ahead of us, I think it is crucial that we do politics differently in our communities and our parties, paving the way for cooperation that is generous, redistributive, and fair. Friends, mountains are made for climbing and we have to practice, we have to look up as well as looking down. We have to imagine what's on the other side and think how much easier it will be with people by our side rather than undertaking things alone. And if we take 
that approach, then I believe that we can do just about anything. Wow, brilliant, Caroline Lucas. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I suppose our decision to change our whole constitution based on that kind of contribution was probably just about right. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, mountains are made for climbing, quite right. And thank you for being our friend um, on the journeys that, that we've been on and, and the more exciting, bigger ones that are to come. Um, so thank you so much. And another friend of mine, uh, a, a deep friend, um, is Clive Lewis. Um, who I think speaks the politics of uh, radicalism, but he does it with a sense of authenticity, um, which is incredibly rare. Someone who really gets um, the pluralism that we're going to need and the radicalism that we're going to need to meet the challenges of the future. So, um, Clive, over to you, and thank you so much for being my friend and being part of Compass and being here tonight. That's all right, Neil. You pay me well uh, to be your friend. So that's that. Uh... But for, I mean, first of all, thank you. I mean, it's it's. I, I mean, I think every speaker that's spoken tonight, as you would expect with such a lineup, has uh, chatted complete sense uh, and made fantastic points uh, from across the breadth and depth of the political discourse that we need to be able to take things forward. Um, the one thing I would say, you know, if you've listened tonight, perhaps for the first time coming into a meeting like this uh, organized by Compass, if you like what you hear, then please do join Compass. I know Neil is going to talk maybe a little bit later about some of the work we're going to be doing in individual political parties, including inside the Labour Party, which I'm particularly keen to hear about and to work with. Um, I would say do join Compass and be part of that change, uh, part of that democratic change, both inside our own party and inside our own country. Um, and I mean, look, I'll start off by saying perhaps we need to start off um, interrogating how far the political system we have in this country right now is democratic. Uh, can what we have right now be called a functioning representative democracy uh, in a meaningful sense? I would say the argument, I would say the answer is probably no. Uh, the Conservative government govern, govern with a massive majority, um, even though they didn't win a majority of the public vote. Minority rule is passed off as the so-called will of the people and taken as a blank check to do whatever they want. And incidentally, that's the way that my own party views doing politics. It's basically a winner takes all, just that we do it poorly. <laughs> So badly that in fact in the last century, we won, I think, just like six out of 26 general elections. The Labour Party is kind of, uh, it's, it's like a kind of child mimicking its older sibling, trying to do what they do, but doing it poorly. Um, and the people of this country are the what people who suffer as a consequence and a result of that. And uh, we'll come on to a minute as to why I think Caroline touched on just then, why it's so important with those ecological, climate, technological uh, cliff edges that we're facing, the, the clock's ticking down, the panel is flashing red, we need to get our house in order and to sort things out. And we don't have a political system that's fit for purpose to enable us to do that. So I think a good example about how things aren't fit for purpose, how poor our democracy is, is the Brexit process. We've seen an extreme centralization in the office of the prime minister on display and the executive, a deal that is going to reshape our relationship with our largest trading partner, has had no input from ele the elected representatives in parliament. We haven't even been given sight of the negotiating text scrutinized. I don't even think about government uh, consulting with people, with public, with civil society, with local authorities. You know, MPs haven't had sight of this. We haven't even been scrutinizing it. Uh, and this is partly what makes a, a description of our political system as an, an elective dictatorship. So fitting as the uh, former Conservative Chancellor, Lord Helsham, um, Lord Chancellor, Hel Lord Helsham called it. So the Conservatives have consistently won power without having the majority of public support for that, for that progressive parties collectively have had on so many occasions. And if you look at what's on the government's agenda, uh, introducing voter ID, you know, the likely changes to constituency boundaries, gutting the Human Rights Act and judicial review, we can see power is being entrenched ever more in their favour. So the UK is now one of the last remaining democracies in Europe to use first part of post, and also one of the last remaining democracies in the world to not have a written constitution. I think the other two are New Zealand and Israel. Um, and the devolution deals in the 1990s devolved some power to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, but beyond that, major democratic reform hasn't happened in over a hundred years uh, when the franchise was extended. So the first part, first part of post is particularly poisonous and it forces political parties to pander to a tiny, minority of voters in swing seats. I think 
You can see that now quite clearly in my own party, and we can perhaps discuss that a little bit later on. Uh, and this leaves the majority in safe seats unheard and alienated. Um, take, for example, you know, black people. Um, I think <laughs> I've been saying to black groups, get behind the PR campaign. Because black people historically have lived in cities. It's where they've congregated to, where most of the work was in the 1950s and 60s. Hence, we're in those kind of safe labor seats. We're taken for granted. Our voice isn't heard. And I think that's something that lots of different groups in society who find themselves um, politically voiceless um, need, to, need to think about, need to unpack. So we have to ask ourselves, is this really a functioning representative democracy? Should we be reinforced in this system that serves so few people? or challenging it and winning power together so that we can implement an alternative. So long as who count, our, so long as it, who count ourselves as progressive choose to play this rigged game, we'll all lose. As long as we keep playing the game that they want us to play, we're gonna keep losing. So I think if we look uh, at the report that Compass has brought out, um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought it was a kind of brilliant, rehash of the earlier 2017 report on Progressive Alliance you brought out, but looking at where we are post-2019 with some of the changes that have taken place. And you know, the Labour Party faces a stark reality of needing to gain 124 seats to win a majority of just one. And I think John took that apart really well when he looked at the, the various different swings that were required. Now, I can't, I'm not here to speak uh, for the front bench, but I will say that during the leadership contest, Keir Starmer rightly acknowledged, acknowledged that people want decisions made closer to them. I think that's how he described it. And that the Labour Party has to address the fact that millions of people vote in safe seats and feel their vote doesn't count. Now, I, I agree with that, but I, I also want to challenge uh, Keir and my party to go further because democracy can't be dictated from the top down. Democracy means trusting the people and giving power to the people. It means giving the microphone to people to speak for themselves, not shouting through it on their behalf. And I think where we, where my fear that we'll see this is on the kind of trumpeted uh, talk on uh, constitutional reform that I think is going to come up in the next couple of weeks or months um, that Keir is going to make. And I think my, my fear is that what we're going to do is we're going to talk the talk of democracy, but we're not going to walk the walk. So you know, there's a lot of people inside the PLP, inside the Labour Party that think, you know, if we're going to have a constitutional convention, we're going to dictate what comes out of that constitutional convention. We might the Liberal Democrats have a little say, but we kind of are going to, the SNP, you know, they're not going to, I don't think, I don't think anyone is contemplating that like I've heard of putting um, independence uh, inside that constitutional convention. But how can you not have independence on them by having it in on that constitutional convention? I think Tommy picked up on this. You begin to have a discussion about what kind of relationship we have, um, whatever the outcome of that constitutional um, uh, deliberation is. Because even if Scotland goes its own way, we're still going to need to have a relationship. Well, let's have all of us, rather than a unilateral decision by Scotland, let's all have a say in that. Let's all discuss that. But I'm, you know, I'm confident, I'm different to Tommy. I think if we put, you know, a, if we put options on the table for people, allow people to choose to decide, they'll pick them up, they'll run with them. And they, they may go for independence, but, they might not. And I think it's about trusting in people to make those decisions. Um, so I think pandering to a minority of voters has failed us in the past and led to actively harmful policies going unchallenged. Um, you know, if you think back to the aftermath of the financial crisis, the Labour Party helped to bolster the austerity project by buying in to false economic narratives about balancing the books. Labour's got to be honest about our values as a party. Silence is complicity, and that includes being loud in our defense of human rights, and particularly the rights of marginalized communities that are being attacked by this government. And I think it's a mistake to think that progressive alliance means that we will suddenly, I mean, I know that this, I've heard this from people, um, but if we have a progressive alliance with Liberal Democrats, it's going to water down our manifesto. It does the exact opposite. It allows using a broken system, and it allows the Liberal Democrats to do what they do best, which is in some seats, fighting the Tories. It allows us to do what's best, which is in some seats, uh, fighting everyone else and winning those seats. Um, so it's about outsourcing, if you want. It allows us to actually to have a manifesto that's far more in tune with our membership and our core support than would otherwise be the case, where you try to stretch yourself too thin to cover too many angles, too many options, too many views. Um, so people want to make decisions, not just to have decisions made closer to them, I think. And to achieve Permanent and lasting change, we, the Labour Party, need to work 
collaboratively with, collaboratively with progressives and other parties and with civil society organizations on a progressive agenda that will decentralize power. And, and I'll finish by saying this. I think, you know, PR for me is a means to an end. Progressive alliance for me is a means to an end. If we as a party can adopt PR, then I'm quite clear that that will set, that will become the glue, the cement, if you want, to enable a progressive alliance. And if we get a progressive alliance, that means that we have a chance of getting over the line on a political, on a broken political system, which is stacked against us. And once you get over the line based on that, that PR, um, PR, that will enable you to bring into effect a different political system, which will level the playing field. And I think enable us to develop a culture which is collaborative. First past the post is divisive. It means we're all pitted against each other. It's the ultimate in kind of Com 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 competition behavior, if you want, competitive behavior. Whereas I think if we move to a culture which is actually more collaborative, that's how we're going to forge the alliances that we need to take on those vested interests, to be able to take on the increasing power of capital and wealth in this new gilded age, to tackle the climate crisis, to tackle the big tech companies that are increasingly and terrifyingly uh, beginning through surveillance capital, uh, capitalism and other uh, methodologies beginning to influence our democracies we are on a series of cliff edges and unless we can change how we do politics then i'm afraid to say we'll have politics done to us and i don't want that and i don't think most of you here on this call tonight want that either brilliant thank you so much clive and someone in the chat said um, what we've got here tonight is the uh, dream cabinet um well let's not dream about it let's begin to make it happen and create the politics which puts all of you lot um, uh, in the positions of, of power that we need. Um, over to Grace and Francis, just to pick out as many questions, of, I think there's been loads of questions, far too many than we've got time for, um, but let's get as many questions in. Um, if the panel can then just come back at the end and, and pick on the one or two questions that they want to answer, and what we'll do with the questions that we've got in the chat, because there've been so many brilliant ones, and the chat itself is we'll save both, and we'll try and answer, you know, all the questions, you know, where you know that, that deserve an answer, uh, whether they're ones of procedure, fact, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of us have kind of got as, as, as much clarity as possible. So over to, to Grace and Francis to begin to kind of feel, get as many of those questions out there as possible. Thank you. Sure. So we've got six to get us started. Um, so I'm going to go in order. Matthew Halbert, Steve Williams, Catherine Budget Meekin, Deborah Crawford, Anthony Hull, and then Alex Cooper. So if you heard your name, get ready. Um, so Matthew, you should now be able to ask your question. Unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Um, so um, I'm just trying to remember what my question was now. Um, I think it was something along the lines of um, it was about you know, labour and electoral reform. That yeah, so, yeah, so apologies, yeah. Uh, oh, no, I put several in there. So, yeah, so um, basically I wanted to ask whether we can get, uh, it's a question we're all asking, um, but whether we can get labour over the line on electoral reform, because certainly as a Lib Dem, um, I really want this progressive alliance to happen. I really want a change of government, but I know that for us, I hate to talk about red lines at a meeting like this, but I just can't see anything hap happening unless we can get Labour over the line on electoral reform. Thanks, Matthew. Steve, are you there to ask your question? Yeah, I'm there. That's uh, fine. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all the speakers in the, the document leads us to the inevitable conclusion that the next general election is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, and I think we need to be prepared, as Caroline said, to hold Labour's feet to the fire. And we need to be prepared for a campaign for a progressive alliance like no other. Now we've got local elections next year uh, and the potential for pluralist progressive alliances to win councils uh, across, uh, across the country. So this is a really important dry run, I think. And I'd be interested in views as to whether um, whether this is what we should be doing uh, and, and if so, how? Thanks, Steve. Um, Catherine, if you're there, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm on you. I'm unmuted. Hello. Um, my qu I had several questions, but the one that seemed to get the biggest m votes was about, is there a rule in the Labour Party, and I'm confused about this, about not uh, standing down in the interests of the bigger picture in a, in a constituency? Thanks, Catherine. 
Um, Deborah's question, uh, she seemed to have lost her, but hers was just saying, are we reaching out to the Women's Equality Party? I can say the short answer to that is yes, but maybe the panel would like to pick up on kind of why that's important. And can I ask, can I just ask the third question, the, the question before that, I, just, I missed it. I didn't quite catch the... My, my, quest, my question, Clive, is, is there a rule in the Labour Party that um, uh, parliamentary candidates must stand uh, and must not step down in the interests of getting, say, a Lib Dem to win. Cool. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Anthony, if you're there, you can unmute yourself. And then... Thanks, Grace. Yeah, um, thank you. Everyone. My question was about um, to each of the panellists, if you had to agree three key things that you would like to see a progressive alliance embrace for a common platform for the 23-24 general election, what would they be? Thanks, Anthony. That's a brilliant question. OK, last one, Alex, and then back to the panel. Thanks, Grace. Uh, I'd just like to say um, um, you've done great work here. You've put in a, a lot of thought and energy and organisation in bringing this together. And I really do hope it's the beginning of something transformative in our politics. Um, but the, the question I've got is around about um, what we've got in common. And, uh, and Caroline and Clive have both touched upon this. And I think we all recognise in the room that we've got to focus on what we've got in common. But how do we um, frame a wider conversation that will allow more people to focus on what we've got in common rather than what divides us? Because politics, it seems to me, is all about differentiation and finding ways to stand out and having a good old argument and winning over the opposition. So how do we focus on our values rather than labels and personalities? Thanks, Alex. Um, um, so back to the panel, if you'd like to jump in on any of those. So Clive, do you want to just do the quickly on Labour and PR and what the prospects are? Because it is central. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so can we get Labour over the line on PR? Yes, I think we can. Um, there's a really there's a real momentum inside the party at the moment. Uh, Labour for a New Democracy are kind of spearheading an umbrella campaign group of um, activists, MPs, trade unionists to try to get this as party conference uh, next year. Now that gets you so far. Uh, my my concern is that ultimately we have a very top down party, and you know the whole point of conference is a kind of is a bit of a constitutional is a bit of a kind of democratic fudge in the sense that we have this really top-down party, um, but we have this kind of seeming sovereign body, which is conference, and very often the top-down bit ignores the conference bit. So I think what that will do, in effect, if we can get that policy passed, which there's no guarantee we can, and there are so many different opportunities for a leadership that pits itself against it or wants to try to water it down to do so. But what it does, I think, it shows the party, it shows the PLP, and it shows the apparatchiks of our party and, and the wider world that there is a hunger for PR inside our party. And that sends a really clear message to other political parties that there is a section of the Labour Party that gets what's wrong and wants to be able to do something about it. Now, the final thing I will say is, even if we've got the policy, um, I think it's really important to understand that that doesn't necessarily mean it will translate into an effective PR policy in the uh, general in the manifesto at the next election. It should do, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will be in there, especially if the uh, Fixed Term Parliament Act um, is removed and we have an election in a, in a kind of snap election, which is possible. Uh, and that means that, that we get, I think, Clause 5, which means that you know a small group of people basically get to decide what our manifesto is. And I think that's a danger uh, where PR basically will be pushed away. So what we have to do in the intervening period is ensure that that political momentum for PR isn't just there in terms of policy, it's also there in terms of a political force that MPs and others understand will not go away and has to be dealt with here and now. Um, thanks. Uh, John, do you want to just remind people what the, what the, the uh, constitutional position is in Labour for people standing down or not? Well, it's actually, it's actually in the gift of our National Executive Committee who have rights to determine the actual rules of the constitution of the party it's not as i remember it and we went through all this in 2017 the nec does have the capacity in association with constituency parties not to stand a candidate but we've just never done it and once you do it once you set the precedent so it becomes a possibility down the road so the first one is so important that's why 2017 was such a close shave because um to do it once 
it is then cast in granite in terms of precedent within the constitutional apparatus of the party, and we were nearly there. Um, I Just one point about the Labour, my view is always, I think a lot of the Labour Party membership and activists have always thought that the Labour leadership will never embrace PR, so it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling strategy, so they don't push hard enough for it. If it can be shown that it's in reach, then I think you can really build a head of steam on it. I know Clive and everyone's doing some fantastic work there. So if we can show it is a top priority across a wide and deep coalition, and this is building, then I think it will really create a trigger point where it just becomes a real organizing principle because as a gateway, as I say, to wider economic and social change, it cannot be seen as a discrete constitutional electoral sort of process question it has to be linked to a wider reset building back better whatever you want to call it in terms of reshaping const, uh, constitution so as to confront environmental degradation create new human rights given the surveillance capital and challenge that clive was talking about all of these things have to be joined up democratizing our economy new economic and social rights foot to work or whatever you want to do it it has to be seen as a sort of a gateway trigger to a wider economic and social reimagination of the country that can be done and if we can create a, enough energy behind it i think you can shunt it right into the mainstream of labor thinking get the unions involved more aggressively because i think they've discounted it for a while now and get it really as a top priority across yeah. the movement it is, but it is key and people are reminding us john in the chat that labor stood aside in Tatton in 97 so you know so so it, it has happened so therefore it you know, it, you know, and it, we need to make it happen again yeah um uh, just a, a quick i'm going to ask caroline and tommy just to come in quickly on the kind of what the policy agenda they see as being in common just to answer steve's questions yes we compass is going to try and work with a bunch of other people not just compass but with XR, with all sorts of other kind of alliance builders and campaigners to try and target some of the county seats in May, because we could trial some stuff and work out where we can do some damage, um, uh, you know, shift some stuff to the no, no overall control or win some stuff for progressives. Um, we're looking at Oxford, Sussex, uh, Surrey, Devon, you know, lo lots of different places. So let us know if you want to kind of work on, you know, that kind of electoral alliance stuff for May, because we need to start organising that now. And yeah, we're, we're you know very keen on supporting and working with the Women's Equality Party. We had Mandy Reid on a call uh, recently. You know, we definitely see them and hopefully they see themselves as being part of this progressive alliance. We just couldn't get everyone on this call uh, tonight. So just quickly over to Tommy, then Caroline, just to pick out a few policy highlights that they think that could be part of this kind of progressive alliance, Tommy? Uh, well, for me, I think it would be three. Um, First of all, it would be a, an overarching uh, agreement. Objective of this was to uh, was to get the Tories out of government. So it was to defeat as many conservative incumbents as possible. Uh, I think the implication uh, the there would be, that unless there's a case otherwise, that um, there would need to be negotiations around supporting the candidate best placed to depose as conservative in each. Uh, in each of those seats and there might be some arguments about that. I think the second thing would be that we should be standing on a, on a, a joint aspiration to modernise uh, democracy and, and government in, in Britain. And I would want to I would argue for a codicil within that, that there is uh, the, the decisions of the electorate living within the individual nations of the UK should be respected in terms of them being able to choose which form of government they want, whether they wish to be the union or to be to be self-governing and have a different relationship. Um, so it's two big ones with lots of little ones. Can I just, Neil, just can I, just, can I just comment on some of the things that have been said about Labour and PR? I mean, I, before I did this, I did, I did do an apprenticeship in the Labour Party before this, and I've been involved in a, a lot of these debates in the, in, in the 80s and 90s in Labour. I mean, I think I think we should remember that certainly in Scotland, uh, twice Labour has taken a policy position to, to execute uh, constitutional change and, and bring in PR. Once for the, the Scottish Parliament itself, which operates on a, 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 a list system, which is not exactly proportional, but I think people recognise it's more than 95% of the way there. Uh, and that was done by the, the, the Westminster Labour government when drawing up the Scotland Act. Admittedly, there their hope in doing that was to prevent the, uh, the SNP ever getting a majority in the Scottish government, but nonetheless, they did it. But secondly, and I think 
probably more relevant is that in the first Labour administration in the in the Scottish Parliament, they passed uh, legislation to reform elections in local government and bring in PR in local government throughout Scotland. And to their credit, they did that, knowing that Labour was going to lose an awful lot of seats in those councils as a result. But uh, principle did triumph in that occasion. I think that needs to be uh, you know, reminded to people. Yeah, and, and uh, the Labour Party in Wales has just passed, a, or in the process of passing legislation to have um, a PR for local elections in Wales as well. So, you know, big inroads have been road. Caroline, just over to you quickly for, a, you know, but what do you see as a kind of common platform agenda? Well, I think constitutional reform, including proportional representation, has got to be at the heart of it, because what we're trying to do here is transform our political system. So that area around PR and constitutional reform is, is the top line. Um, kind of cheating slightly in terms of, of the number of, of policies we're allowed. My second one would be around a Green New Deal, uh, which kind of brings everything together anyway. But um, Clive and I are co-chairs of the all party group um, in Parliament for a Green New Deal. We tried to put down a joint parliamentary bill on a Green New Deal, which completely befuddled the parliamentary authorities because it turns out you can't table a joint bill. You have to have one name taking priority above all the others, but that was quite interesting. But anyway, a Green New Deal, obviously net zero by 2030, but with all of the social policies there as well that enables the, the just transition. Um, and then I, I guess the third one would probably be something like a universal basic income, because I just think people's chronic insecurity right now is one of the most corrosive elements in terms of, of, of yeah, ruining people's life chances, their hopes, their aspirations and so forth. So that universal basic income, I think, would be a good start. OK, brilliant. Thanks, Karen. Uh, great. Let's get some, a final round of questions before we come back to the panel for the, for the final bit to finish at seven o'clock. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we had a question from Padav about a constitutional convention. I'm just trying to bring them in. There we go. So you should be able to speak now. Um, yeah, there we go. Yes, I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to ask what what panel members felt was the most credible route pathway to a constitutional convention, a UK-wide constitutional convention based on uh, a citizen convention as a, a mechanism for transformative change. I mean, for me, it, it seems the only way, we, because we've got first past the post, we're stuck with that now and we have we are where we are. Uh, the, only, the only way we can get there is having a hung parliament with Labour as the single largest party, but needing uh, other parties to cooperate. Fantastic. Let's get two more in, shall we, Grace? Sure. Um, so, do, uh, sorry, that's why I got found. Daniel Laycock, you had a question. If you're there, you, you can uh, ask it to the panel. And then I'm going to go to Mike Humphrey after that. Uh, okay. Daniel, I'll read your question out just because we're short of time. So he says, how can we get parties working together on this as some in other parties might not want this? How can we get regional parties working together as Clive, Caroline, Leila and Tommy have begun this process? And Daniel, it tells us he's the regional coordinator of the Eastern Green Party. Um, and then the final question, actually I'm gonna go to Chris Ogden. Uh, Chris. So Chris, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Come on, Chris, don't be shy. I can see you've unmuted yourself, but um, I can read it out. So he says, what can those of us living in safe seats do to help this initiative? Uh, what Would it be better to build city, region or regional alliances between parties so activists can direct their attentions to the seats that need them most? OK, so we've got a bunch of kind of, you know, and, and this is important, you know, operational things. So I'm going to come back to the panel. We've got we've got eight minutes. So you've got kind of you know, 90 seconds each or something, um, both to answer any of those operational bits. And, and, and the process of this stuff does matter and will matter, as all of you know. But also just to say your final word um, uh, 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 as well. Um, John, can you come up first? That'd be great. Thank you. Then Tommy, then Clive, then Caroline. Um. The debate around the Constitutional Convention, I think, reveals all of the, the tensions in and around this, around Labour, because the amount of meetings we've had with all sorts of different leaderships from the left and right from whoever, who are all keen to embrace the Constitutional Convention 
election, especially when they're standing for the leadership. And then immediately after there's a meeting, it goes something like this. Yeah, this, this is very important, but what's it going to produce? What's the outcome? So the outcome, the, it has to, they have to control the outcome so as to embrace the process, which is diametrically yeah. against the yeah. whole character and yeah. the reason exactly. why it's Wrong. such an important initiative because it cracks open the fix. But without the fix, no leaders will embrace it. And that could be the dilemma, could be the dilemma um, with Keir and uh, the Constitutional Convention where he might use it simply to secure a fix policy-wise vis-a-vis the SNP in Scotland rather than an attempt to rewire the constitution of the of Britain and that is that's that's got tripwires around it in terms of Labour and the constitutional convention and um, having said that it's worth exhausting the debate to try and again I don't think we should simply be relying on the leadership to embrace these things this has to percolate we have to create alliances so it, it becomes almost something irresistible because once it gets to that stage, then I think the whole thing could crack open, not just in terms of the constitution and electoral reform, but a wider series of economic and social rights. So a, a much more radical pluralistic politics is in play if we can get to that sort of critical mass, especially in and around Labour. And that is in reach, given some of the things I've been hearing about the amount of MPs, the amount of the membership, the work that's going on to secure a debate in conference. This is very much in play, almost for the first time since the late 80s, I would say. And that is a huge prize to totally reset the character of the party it is a possibility now. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, John. Tommy, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. M most of the questions were, were directed at me and I've been looking at the, the chat and trying to pick up at the points as well. I mean, from our point of view, uh, you know, we, we are concentrating on what happens in May. We will be unequivocally putting to people in Scotland the, the prospect of voting to have a referendum without condition or qualification on how they should be governed in the future. If we are successful in that, uh, and if we have a, a majority mandated parliament, then I would appeal to uh, liberal, democratic and progressive people elsewhere in, in these islands to support the right of the Scottish people to be able to make that decision. They may or may not then subsequently vote for, for independence, and there will be a, a big debate on what that means, how it can be achieved, and crucially, what the relationship of the new Scotland would be with the rest of the island that we share with uh, with uh, 60 million other people. So uh, that, you know, that, that debate will happen, but I think what is important is that the right of people to determine their future of government should be respected. And that actually was the basis of an agreement between the Liberal Democrats, the Labour Party and the SNP in Scotland uh, in the run up to 1997. It was called the Claim of Right for Scotland uh, and all parties signed up to it saying that uh, it was for the people themselves to determine whether or not they wish to continue to be in a government arrangement as part of a union with the Wales or whether they wish some other thing. And that means that if that claim of right heritage is to be respected going forward debates about the future constitutional changes in, in the United Kingdom, and anyone who sets up a constitutional convention that, that preempts and excludes the ability of people to vote to become a self-governing nation uh, is, is going to, you know, we, there's no other way that we could support that. It would be a bit of an on starter. On the other hand, it would be good to have a dialogue about other options, and we would welcome participating in that, I mean, I'd like to know what what a federal UK would actually mean. I mean, but if it was possible, well, I'll I'll take a look at it. I'd like to know in the current context what a devil max option would, would actually look like. You know, so we, we're happy to engage in, in in this debate, but we think the important principle to be uh, to be defended is the right of the people of Scotland to take the final decisions about themselves. But in doing that, I want to leave with an upbeat message, which is, you know, whether the omens look quite good for us in Scotland at the minute in terms of a, 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 you know, a long term ambition about moving towards becoming a more self-governing country. But I want to reassure people that this is not, you know, we're not leaving Britain. We're not going anywhere. We're still going to be there. And if uh, I and my colleagues have our way, we will lose that capacity for self-government in Scotland in order to build relationships across Britain and make things better 
across these islands as well, whether that be tackling inequality, tackling the climate emergency, or anything else we need to do as people who inhabit the same island in this world. Okay, brilliant. Thank, thanks, Tommy. Clive, final thoughts from you? Uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of the question on constitutional convention, I mean, for me, uh, getting that constitutional convention, getting everyone around the table to sit down and talk about the future of this country, that has to be, I don't think we're going to see that under a conservative government. Uh, and I think we, you know, whilst we could do that off of our own back now, outside of government, to, to go through some of those questions and to get some of those answers and to listen and to come and to discuss with people where we go next that is a possibility otherwise though i think it's you know as a minority possibly as a minority labor-led government uh, as part of a constitutional settlement we bring together that constitutional convention uh, we put everything on the table and we allow people trusting people and i think that's a way forward on that i think the analogy i would use at the moment for where the labor party is I've been sat here thinking it is a bit elitist, but it's a bit like skiing downhill. And I think John touched on it. it, it when you're skiing, you, every, every instinct, every political instinct is to lean back. Okay. And what happens when you lean back is you go faster and faster and you lose control. Uh, and, and that's where I think we are at the moment. We're leaning back politically and we think that that's going to give us control, but it's actually the exact opposite. And what we've got to do, you've got to lean into the hill. You've got to lean into the mountain and trust in the kind of political physics of democracy and the inherent goodness of the values that you espouse and the people who espouse them with you um, to, uh, to that it will get you will begin to gain control. That's how you control the political system, not through kind of dictating it, but by letting it go, by giving it out to people and people will repay that back to you. And it's really hard for Labour at the moment because we are hooked on second place. We are hooked on the current system and we don't know how to get out of it. And there is a route map. It just requires trust in democracy, trust in people. And that is hard. I understand that. But unless we do that, we are going to, you know, head off that cliff edge. And I, and I don't want to head off the cliff edge. So the last thing I would say is, how can you influence things uh, on the ground? You know, look, I saw some of the comments uh, just now where people were saying, the Corbyn gang are the enemy. They're our enemy as well. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> we're trying to form progressive alliances here. You don't have to agree with everything everyone says you don't have to agree with um half of what everyone says but you will find issues where you can find agreement and it's like okay we can we can we can disagree with each other on those issues but where we agree with each other let's find common ground and let's move forward that's a completely different culture political culture to the one we have at the moment and you know myself caroline tommy Layla, uh, liz savile roberts and others we all meet regularly not because we have every single thing in common, but because there are things that we know in common as a critical mass that we understand we need to work together on politically to be able to achieve our common goals. Otherwise, we could just sit there and take pot shots, pot shots at each other. People need to do that on the grounds, in their local authorities, in their political party for a start in the Labour Party, but also how we talk and communicate with others. Uh, that's how you start this. That's how you begin the process. Brilliant. Thanks, Clive. Final word from you, Caroline. Well, here, here to Clive. Um, you know, Compass has spawned a lot of metaphors over, over the years. It used to be the tents on the campsite, and it feels now we've got the mountain. Only I'm climbing up one, and Clive skiing down the other one. I'm not quite sure what, that, what actually that means. But, um, <laughs> Off a cliff edge. <laughs> yeah, and there's a cliff edge there as well. Perfect. Um, on the Constitutional Convention, just very quickly to say that Graham Allen, bless him, who's a former Labour MP, has done a lot of work on this, working with quite a few university departments to really work out how you would make a constitutional convention work in a way that couldn't get controlled by whichever party it was who had given it its blessing, whether that's Labour or anyone else. So there is a lot of work done there. I don't think there's any danger in terms of not having good ideas about how to make it work. It's just how you get it up and running in the first place. And there have been some conservative backbenchers who've been in favour of it, but not yet uh, from the front bench. I think I wanted to end actually by going back to the question from um, from Steve, because I don't think we answered that question. It was a question about um, local elections, um, because it feels to me that that is the, the, the next best time coming up, local elections next year, where we could try to have a bit of proof of concept here. You know, so when people are asking about what should regional parties do or whatever, well, depending on whether or not you've got elections, if you don't have elections where you are, uh, or if you want to start building up m more trust um, ready for the general election and you live in a safe seat, then why don't we, try this with the local elections and look at some places like we've done in Lewis, for example, where Greens and Labour and Lib Dems came together to work out and some independents 
uh, which seats they would they would try to go for. And as a result, they got the Conservatives out of Lewis Council uh, and they've set up some good working relationships. It wasn't easy, but they did it. And we've got lots to learn from, from them, I think. So let's not leave this until the next anniversary of a general election. Let's use what we've been talking about tonight as an opportunity to do a dry run in these local elections. If nothing else, what it will do is to build trust because there's nothing better than actually talking to people and working alongside them to, to build that trust. And then I believe we could also get a bit more proof of concept at those local elections, yeah. which would help us in the mountain that we are going yeah. to. Brilliant. Um, we've got a dry ski site run apparently for the county elections from uh, from Caroline Lucas there. Look, thank you to the, the, the dream team tonight there, Caroline Clive, Tommy John in her, in her absence, Layla, thank you for grace and thank you all for being part of this, all the chat, all the questions, we'll use all of it, we'll keep all of it. Uh, do, as people have been saying in the chat, you know, join Compass. We can only make this happen if you join us and support us so that together we can leave no stone unturned, no one effort un unmade. Um, it's up to us. Are we big enough? Are we brave enough? Are we determined enough? Are we clever enough to do this? We have to be. Remember a year ago and how desperate you felt well, think about now, contrast that to this meeting and what politics can be like and what we can achieve and the sort of hope that we can build something better together. Let's do it. Let's commit ourselves to that. Thanks, everyone. Keep safe, keep well, keep hopeful and keep going and we'll change this government and we'll change our country. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.